Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, whatever time you're watching this video. Um, today, what we're going to do in this video is we're going to do a recap of week two. Um, currently just finished week three, so expect that video to come out shortly, but let's get started with week two. Let's go ahead and share the screen, share the audio, and get everything ready. And we're looking good. Okay, so for week two and any other previous week that we get to, uh, expect it all in the uh, particular unit that we're working on. So right now we're wrapping up unit three uh, and you'll, there you'll find week two materials. So the agenda for week two was a bit optimistic uh, in retrospect. And so what we're looking at uh, when it loads in is what do we end up doing? On Monday, we recapped um, where we left off before spring break happened. And then we got started on our notes at the tail end of that. Um, so the notes on subatomic particles uh, took up our Tuesday and that pushed everything back. And so what we ended up getting into for week two was at the end of the week, we got through our notes and the practice with the electron configuration. And so uh, during week two, one assignment was due, lesson one, exploring atomic structure, and you should have added on to your weekly reflections with your second one. And so if you are missing those notes, they are located in the week two folder. If you're missing the practice with the electron configuration, which is located in that week two folder. Now, you should have copied and pasted those notes and that uh, practice assignment into your own notebook. And so if you were to click on the one I work out of right there, I have it open already. Let me zoom in, uh, make it look better on your screens. What you should have on your uh, notebook so far, if you're uh, caught up to week two is lesson one, the notes on subatomic particles, the notes on the energy of atoms, and the practice with electron configuration, which was due Friday, April 16th. Now, in this video, I'm only gonna be talking about the stuff we covered, none of the recap stuff from week one. Uh, so just going through these notes, I'll be going back and forth between the presentation here, as well as our uh, notes over here. So I'll be just going back and forth between these guys. Uh, I will not be playing the videos from the notes because of YouTube policies. I don't want to get anything like banned or like just taken away. So there's that. Uh, let's go presenter view. Okay. And so the start of our notes here are the start of subatomic particles. And so you're all aware of what an atom is, hopefully. An atom is our basic like building block. Uh, and we start off our notes here with kind of a history lesson. How do we get to our knowledge about atoms? And where it starts are in the early 1900s with experiments like the cathode ray tube experiment. And so as you can see, there's a green light right here. And that green light, if we take a magnet to it, that green light will either be attracted or be repelled, okay? And so that gave scientists at the time an understanding that an atom is not just a block, or right? it's not just a sphere, it's got a charge to it. It's got either a positive and a negative charge. And so this experiment was significant because it let scientists know just a little bit more about the atom. Let's go over here. Okay, how else did scientists figure out uh, the interior of the atom? Well, they used these subatomic particles. They used alpha particles, they used beta particles, they used gamma rays, and they used uh, neutrons. They used all sorts of stuff to figure out the interior here. Um, and so we have alpha particles. Notice how big they are. We have beta particles, a little bit smaller. We have gamma rays, uh, thin enough and fast enough where they're essentially unstoppable. You would need a lot of concrete. 
All right. And so a little riddle I posed in week two was about cookies, right? An evil supervillain has uh, trapped you and is forcing you to eat three cookies. Each of them are emitting one of these types of radiation, alpha, beta, or gamma. You got to eat one. You have a lead box you can put a cookie into, and you have your pocket. So you can store a cookie there. The riddle goes, you have to eat one of those cookies. Which one do you eat? You eat the gamma ray cookie. Reason being, if you put it in the lead box, the gamma rays are going to get to you anyway. If you put it in your pocket, they're going to get to you anyway. So you might as well just eat it. The beta particle is small enough where the lead box could do some work. It will protect you from those beta particles. And so you put the beta cookie in the lead box. The alpha particle is big enough where a sheet of paper is enough to, to block it for the most part. Uh, and so you put that one in your pocket in order to be safe from it. Right? The key is safety. And I'm going to be referring back to these particles as time goes on. All right. Uh, so what else do we have here in this image? In this image, we have these things called neutrons and, oh, that was a terrible line. We have neutrons and protons. We also have those electrons. Uh, I kind of ripped this image off of a French place. So like, it's not exactly English. Uh, but anyway, in this uranium particle, we can see that uranium releases alpha particles, my bad here, alpha particles, gamma rays, and neutrons. It has protons in the interior, and that's going to be our positively charged particle. And it's got electrons just kind of orbiting the outside. And so uh, that's kind of going to take us to our next slide here. Let's see. OK, good. I want to make sure where I get the uh, recap set in. And so our atom is composed of three things, our neutrons, our protons and our electrons, all right? Two of those uh, subatomic particles have a charge. The electron is negatively charged and the proton is positively charged. The neutrons are neutral. They kind of act like a spacer, making sure those protons don't just split apart. Um, they keep the gap, right? So that the positive charges don't repel each other. Now, your number of electrons and your number of protons will be equal to each other, right? Because all the chemicals, all chemicals want to be, uh, are, they are neutral, right? So your number of protons and your number of electrons will always equal each other. Let's go down here. We talked about the cookie. Now, uh, the reason I talk about the history of our atom is because we get to a point at some point in our lives where science becomes uh, incomprehensible. We don't understand it anymore. And so we put labels on things, right? And so you put labels that you don't understand uh, for explanations that you need. And so we get, we get to this idea of quantum. What does quantum mean? Uh, and most of us will think, oh, okay, quantum, that's obviously science. And so it's like, it's new science. So it's got to be brand new stuff. It's high tech, quantum computers, quantum uh, keys, quantum cryptography, right? So many words I got quantum in it. It's obviously science-y, but it, no, it means a very specific thing, at least for chemists. And so we're going to look back at our previous theories here. I asked you guys this in class, and most of us are familiar with the nuclear model, which is uh, what I ended up putting in. A few of us are familiar with the planetary model. I'll just stay here for this one. And so we have a very clear, like, lineage, right? Like a family tree. We start off with our solid sphere. Okay, that's what we all know our atoms. We've got building blocks as our atoms. We realize that there are charges attached to these atoms, positive and negative charges. Okay. And then later on, we build, right? We say, okay, no more is that positive charge is kind of in that general area. It's a condensed positive charge, that's our nucleus. Uh, but these electrons, they're not in any kind of random orbit. They're in a very specific pattern. That's where we get to the planetary level. And then later on, we know that 
Okay, it's not exactly very specific orbits. It's just an area where you're more likely to find electrons, and that's our quantum model, right? So we build on top of our theories, right? They're not just static. We are building on top of them in order to account for all the little changes, right? It's like um, how we know the Earth is not the center of our universe. It's the sun that's the center of our galaxy, which centers a black hole or something, right? We build based on new information. And so let's talk about how we got to that point. And the first thing was this experiment of the gold foil experiment. This experiment proved to chemists that the interior of our atom looks like a, looks like a solid sphere. It's a nucleus. So most of it, here we go. Let's actually just uh, recap this experiment. The idea was if you shoot these alpha particles, remember the big chunky particles, if you shoot those alpha particles at a piece of gold foil, gold foil is very thin, most or all, actually all of those alpha particles should go right through because the expectation is these are just charges, right? They'll go right through. But what ended up happening was that a few of those particles end up getting deflected or reflected right back. And that proved to the uh, person running the experiment that there is a core to our atom and that core is very positively charged because it deflected those positively charged alpha particles right and so we end up with our nuclear model uh, fun fact these guys were friends and rutherford was trying to prove thompson right but um he actually ended up proving him completely wrong so that's a little fun fact Okay, let's go back over here. And so we answered uh, these uh, yes or no kind of questions through Zoom polls. And we got to our last point here, which is the idea that atoms have to have a neutral, aka a zero charge. And so if you've got a number of protons, right? And a number of electrons, those two have to be equal. They gotta be the same. Uh, in order to get that neutral charge. Your positive and negative charges got to be equal. So if I have five protons, I have five electrons. If an atom has four protons, it must also have four electrons. And so uh, what it comes down to when we're talking about the properties of an element, it really is dependent on these charges, those positive and negative charges. Neutrons are important, don't get me wrong. Everything is important, but if you had to prioritize, it's the protons and especially those electrons that become very important in determining uh, elements and whether or not those elements will react. Okay, so that was our first set of notes that took about a day and a half. And now we get to our second set of notes. Uh, over here. Okay, actually, I think we could stick around here. All right, so for this set of notes, we're looking at the energy that these atoms have. You'll notice uh, for our previous set of notes, I only got to this point here. Uh, in, our, in the energy of atoms, we get to the planetary model. Okay, and we figure out how that came about. So for the energy of atoms, we're looking at just how much energy do these atoms have and how do we know? And it comes down to this thing called wavelength. The longer your wave, that the more that energy of that atom, of that electron, the more that energy is kind of spread out. And so that's a very low energy kind of thing. These radio waves, they are very long, about 100 meters. Think about like running the track at our school, right? That's more or less 100 meters. And so radio waves are very, very long. They're very, very low energy type of, uh, type of uh, let's call it radiation. Microwaves, a little bit better, right? They warm up food. That's a lot of energy to warm up a lot of food. And so their wavelength is very short, one centimeter, right? You go even smaller to a tenth, no, a hundredth of a centimeter. 
and then looking at infrared, the stuff that lets uh, those night vision goggles work. Now, where does this come into play for uh, atoms? Well, it comes into play because we have two ways to tell if something's energetic or not. Based on the color it produces, right? We can say, okay, this is a very low energy kind of chemical. Uh, and more specifically, the wavelengths down here, right? So nanometers are smaller than centimeters. And by the time we get to very, very, very small nanometers, like gamma rays, we're looking at very energetic uh, pieces of radiation, types of radiation. So gamma rays, like I said earlier, they'll go through meters of concrete. It's very hard to stop gamma radiation because it's so energetic. Um, in Chernobyl, uh, great documentary series by HBO, uh, they mention the fact that gamma ray uh, are energetic enough to cause acute, rest, uh, acute radiation syndrome, which could lead to death pretty rapidly within the space of a few months just from radiation. And that's a very dangerous thing to have these short wavelengths. For our purposes though in chemistry, we're gonna be talking about the different colors, right? And so sodium, strontium, and copper produce different colors when burned. Sodium produces a orangish color, strontium produces a reddish color, and copper produces like a greenish color. And so if you burn them, it suggests different things about these chemicals. It suggests that these chemicals have electrons and those electrons are organized in a certain, in a certain patterns and the copper has the most energy. So let's talk about how that works as far as energy is concerned. And so let's say we have, we have copper and you burn it. Well, actually let's say copper and this is copper's electron. This is negatively charged, copper's positively charged. And so let's say you go ahead and you input a ton of energy. You, you burn the copper. Well, what ends up happening is that this electron gets really energized. It's like your kid brother after you give him a ton of sugar. It gets energized and it goes all over the place. It actually jumps up a few levels, right? And then pending on where it goes, it has to come back down eventually. And when it does come back down, it has to release photons. It releases that energy it got as light. Right, so depending on the color of light, you could kind of determine the energy level, how much energy that electron produced. And so this is what we're looking at as part of an atom. This is kind of the reasoning we have these planetary models because we now know that, okay, there are levels to our, uh, there are levels to our atoms here. And these chemicals jump back and forth between these levels when they're energized. Let's go ahead and end it. All right, so gamma rays, how are gamma waves different from wa radio waves? Well, look at the uh, wavelength. Very, very tiny, very, very big. So the bigger something is, the less energetic it is. The smaller the wavelength, the more energetic it is. And so, which would have more energy? Something that produces a red light or a blue light? Well, the answer to that is the blue light because the blue light has a much shorter wavelength, about 450 versus 750. So it's a lot shorter. And so if you uh, take a spectroscope and you energize this hydrogen, you see it's got different wavelengths, right? It jumped up, that electron jumped up a few levels and we get these different bands of light. And so every chemical has its own specific band. And you can determine from really, really far away what a chemical is based purely on the light it produces. So that's pretty interesting stuff. Uh, let's skip right by this and get to the good stuff here. All right, so we know that electrons have levels to them. 
what we need to next know is how are these electrons organized? And this is where electron configuration comes in. We figure out how these electrons are organized, they're configured. And so we get to explain this part here. And so the energy level, uh, let's go back to red. I like that better. So the energy level is just the period, right? So one, two, three, all the way down to seven. There are seven energy levels max. If you're looking at this, you should see that this S, this helium block kind of goes right here. And so we have S block, D block, P block, and F block. Now, what do I mean by this? We have energy levels, right? So let's uh, draw an image here of a atom. We have this atom. It's got an energy level. At that energy level, that orbit will look like an S. It's a sphere. S for sphere. At the second energy level, this is where things get complex, we have two types of orbit. We have S and P. And so the S orbit was a different shape for, than the P orbit, but in total it could hold two electrons from two, or two electrons from the S orbit and six electrons from the P orbit. And so if I was, oh, get that out of there. And so if I'm writing down the uh, electron configuration for chlorine, I know that it's got to go to the first energy level, which is just one S, and there are two electrons there. I know I have a second energy level, and I have the S orbit, 2S2, and the P orbit, 2P6. All right, just going straight through, because this is telling me those energy levels. And then I have the third energy level, which is where chlorine is found, 3S2, 3P5. And so I know that chlorine has three energy levels, meaning if I drew out chlorine, it would have three circles around it. I run out of space there. It's got three circles around it. And I know in that outermost energy level, these orbitals, uh, I know that for the outermost orbital, I've got two electrons from the S suborbit and five electrons from the P suborbit. So in total, that's seven. We're going to call them valence electrons. Okay, so because we could add up the electrons at that outermost level, we call those valence electrons. And so for sulfur, sulfur in its outermost energy level, that third energy level, has two and four electrons. And so it's got six total valence electrons. Let's scroll down here. Uh, actually, missed a few. So we did that for argon and calcium. And we went down here for the dot structure. The dot structure is how we show valence electrons. So for sulfur, sulfur's got six dots around it. One, two, three, four, five, six. Notice how there are no dots in the corners. You got to put them either below or above or left or right. That's where those dots go. So sodium, for example, the point of electron configuration is to get the valence electrons and see how the rest of the electrons are organized. And so let's take a look at sodium. Sodium is element number 11. It's got, therefore, 11 electrons. Let's see how they're placed. You got one, you got two electrons in that S orbit. They're going, they, you show them as up and down because electrons are negative and they don't want to be near each other. And so you basically say, you say up and down basically to show that one is going the opposite direction of the other. So you have two electrons right here. And in that second orbit, you've got two in the S suborbit, one, two. And you've got six in the P suborbit. So a total of eight 
so far. Oh, you know what? My bad. I don't have 11 electrons. I've got nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You know, what? I can't count. Let me go ahead and just do something real quick. I feel like I am right with 11, but I don't remember anymore. Okay, good. Sodium is element number 11. I was right. Hard to confirm. I cannot count for some reason. It's been a long day. So you have two electrons right here, two right there, six right there. That adds up to 10. And there's my 11th one. And so in the outermost energy level, that outermost orbital, we got one valence electron. And to show the dot structure, we just put a dot next to uh, sodium. Easy peasy. All right, so we've talked about electrons. Let's wrap it up here and talk about neutrons. Neutrons are going to be how we find uh, atomic mass. I'm kind of backwards there. So on the periodic table, you got two numbers, right? So boron has got five and 10. Carbon has got six and 12. The smaller number is our atomic number. That's the number of protons. So carbon has got six protons. Boron has got five protons. The mass number is the number of neutrons and protons combined. So if you need to know your number of neutrons, you just subtract the two numbers. And this is that notation. This is uh, something we called AZX notation. The mass goes on top, the protons go on bottom, and you just subtract the two to get your neutrons. And so some chemicals will have a parenthesis around them. That's because we don't know uh, the exact number of neutrons that they'll have. We don't know their exact mass because sometimes they're just isotopes. And so uranium has got two forms. And so those are isotopes. They got different numbers of neutrons. All right, that takes us to this practice assignment here. We're looking at numbers one through four. And so this practice assignment, we are working with this. Number one, organizing these elements in terms of energy based on the color they produce. It's a little bit of a uh, hard thing to do without the wavelength, but you know, I believe in you. I did the first one. So red with our lowest amount of energy is number four, which whatever, whichever one is highest, you would label one, second highest two, third highest three. With the electron configuration for aluminum, I did it two ways, the short way and the long way. I didn't cover the short way in this video, but it's pretty self-explanatory. By putting the end of the previous uh, row in brackets, so we put neon in brackets, that basically says we've covered everything before neon. And so for aluminum, we put neon in brackets. Now we can just say 3s2, 3p, and aluminum is the first one there, one. 3s2, 3p1. We add up two and one, and that tells us our valence electron. So aluminum will have three dots around it, three valence electrons. And next we could fill on the chart here. So we go into the P table website, figure out where aluminum is. Aluminum is element number 13. Ah, excuse me, I had to sneeze. Aluminum's element number 13, its weight is 26.9. We go back and fill those in. We round it down because for some reason I said to round it down and we get our atomic mass. We subtract atomic mass by the number of protons. So 26 minus 13, that's 13. The number of electrons is equal to our number of protons, which is also 13. And the number of valence electrons, that's based off of your dot structure. If you got three dots, you got three valence electrons. If you add two plus one, that's three valence electrons. You can also look at the, the uh, last number here where I've highlighted, and that's also going to show your valence electrons. So that was our recap. I hope you enjoyed. I'll put timestamps down below. Click to the parts you find most useful, and I'll see you in class later. Bye-bye. Have yourself a great rest of the day.